I kind of thought today that it, this would be my privilege in introducing tonight's speaker because I think I know him the best. We've been married for 21 years and we've been together for 23 and I actually had somebody ask me 30 minutes ago if I had any idea about this part of his life when we met and I said, you know what? He didn't even mention that on our first couple of dates and maybe even for a year after that. But now it's a big part of my life, like it's always been a big part of his life. And I'm excited for him to tell his story about how he became somebody that races pigeons. And one thing I wanted to point out that I've thought about and we've talked about as a family is that we moved a lot when we were raising our kids. I think I counted 14 different times we moved. And the kids would know if we were in a house that we were going to stay in for very long as soon as the pigeon pen went up in the backyard. Because you have to stay in one place for like two or three years before you start getting your pigeons going. So every time there was a pigeon pen in the backyard, the, the kids knew that dad was happy. So I want you to know that I am very privileged to be able to introduce the best man I've ever met that I just happened to be married to, Kevin Allen. Uh, Robin made the comment that uh, the kids and her knew when we were there to stay because uh, a, a pigeon pen would appear in the backyard. That's kind of how it was. I never uh, got permission or told her I was going to set it up because that was kind of like uh, a commitment. And, uh, and I'm not really into that. And so uh, I didn't want to uh, make a commitment. And sometimes I'd start a pen and not finish it and never put a bird in it. It'd be, I'm considering staying. You know, we're thinking about living here a couple of years. And then a few months later, uh, there's a network marketing opportunity in Timbuk3, and we're down the road. And uh, that's how, it, Robin didn't uh, add to that part that the reason uh, we move so much is that we've been network marketers our whole married life, and we go where the action is, baby. That's just how that works. Uh, I remember Brandy Carls, our master distributor, I was, riding with her one time and told her the story that, yeah, I mean, if I meet somebody, I move in with them. That's kind of a saying that we have. I move in with them. And uh, Brandy and I went and did a meeting in Winnipeg. It was first ever meeting in, in Winnipeg. I've never been back. It's very cold there. No, I have been back. It's a good place. But we went there, and it was a great meeting. The first meeting in Winnipeg, we had like uh, 14, 15 guests there, and six or eight of them joined. And there were two really, really good people. Now, that may not sound much to you that aren't network marketers, but to a network marketer, that's just like you fell into a gold mine. And uh, we got in the car and we were headed for the next place, a place called Brandon. Uh, and uh, I, she said, so critique me, how'd it go? And I, we got into this conversation. I said, well, the only difference in you and me is that I wouldn't have left. And she says, what do you mean? I said, I would have moved in. She says, what does that mean? I'm, you move in? I said, you move in. You know, you get somebody that's interested and you move in and you work with them and you help them grow uh, an income together. And uh, she didn't really know whether to believe me or not. And so I called Robin and I swear to you, not staged at all. This was like five, six years ago is all. I called Robin and I said, it's Kevin. I'm going to be gone a few weeks. And she said, you found a hot one. I said, yes, I did. And I said, I'll talk to you later. And I hung up. And it just proved to Brandy that, that that's what we did. That's why we've been so successful uh, in network marketing. So anyway, uh, pigeons have been a, a, an interesting part of my life. Uh, they started uh, back a long time ago, actually. Uh, I was... Uh, Keaton was five, going on six. So I was 28. Uh, I was 28. Let's see if this is going to work for me. Here we go. Okay, so this is, uh, this is my Uncle Philip. Uncle Philip was uh, a pigeoneer. I mean, this is a man who loved pigeons uh, most of his life, and he always had a loft in his backyard. He's my dad's uh, oldest brother, and my dad was much younger than him. Dad was born late. Uh, parents don't really know how that happened, and he just showed up like 20 years later uh, after the other kids were all done. And so my dad was the same age as his nieces and nephews, a lot of them. 
And this particular older brother, Philip, uh, was different than most of the rest of my family. Uh, very much like us at heart, but different in, in his life. In that, I think he was the only divorced person I'd ever known at that young age. And, and as, it turned, <clears throat> as it turns out, the, the divorces had something to do with pigeons, I found later, a, a lot of times, because not every woman can deal with it. Because some say that a man loves his birds more than anything else in the world. And, uh, you know, so that's not true. That's not true. But uh, my Uncle Philip was my favorite uncle. He was, he was kind of grouchy uh, to us young kids. Uh, he always had a beard, uh, not a grown-in one. He wore a beautiful pencil-thin mustache that he kept trimmed like nobody I'd ever seen before. Just that perfect trimmed in uh, veteran, too, from the Marines. And, uh, but he always had stubble uh, on the weekends. He, he didn't like to shave. I don't like to shave. And uh, when he'd see us kids, he'd dig that beard into our neck and just like that, and he'd scare us. Uh, he'd cuss. We, we didn't have any of that in my family. And he'd swear once in a while, and he'd do it just to get us to giggle. You know, and, and, uh, and he'd tell us funny little off-color ditties. Now, the off-color ditties weren't sexually off-color. They were just have a naughty word in them. And he'd tell us something, and, and we'd all just laugh, and he was one of our favorites. We loved him, but he was grouchy. He was grouchy. We didn't know why, but he kind of had a tough... And it was a little strange. He was a mortician. I mean, you can't know a mortician and not kind of look at him strange. Like, hey, how's the dead today? You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Because you know that's where they've been. They've been touching dead people. But he was a gifted mortician. Uh, if ever anyone had an accident where reconstruction was necessary, he was an artist. And he had true compassion and love for the families that he helped. He was a great man. I thought he was a great man. But he, he was out there. And he got married lots of times. Uh, nobody knows for sure how many, but eight or nine. And it was fun because he was always living somewhere different. But every time we'd see him, the one constant was his birds. His birds were his constant. So I remember the only time, the first time, I was about five, when my dad said, we're going to go visit Uncle Philip and see his pigeons. And there was a reverence that came over my father. He says, now i got to tell you, you've got to be real quiet around the birds. And you can't, you can't touch them, and, and don't ask any questions. I mean, my dad was kind of like that with his own older brother. And so we went over to his house in Mesa. It was one of the rare times he was living not far from us. And uh, we got there. Good-looking guy, isn't he? Uh, we got there to his house, and... It was a Saturday. I know this because of other things you'll learn in the third and fourth hour tonight. But <laughs> I, I know that it was Saturday because there was a race going on. Now, you don't even know what that means. I didn't know what that meant at five or six. But we get there and there's a race going on. So Uncle Philip kind of, uh, my dad, he says, what are you doing here? You know, it's kind of Uncle Philip. What are you doing here? That's what well, you said we could come see. Not on Saturday morning. What are you thinking? You know, this kind of thing. And he says, well, I, I got all the boys. We were all in the back of the pickup, and uh, there are five of us. And he says, uh, my boys want to see the birds. Fine, get them out, you know, bring them over. And we go to this, and immediately we come around this corner, and there they are, up on their perches, these beautiful birds, different colors. And they're up there on their perches. And we're looking at them, and he says, okay, we got to go. Philip says, you got to go. It's race day, and I'm expecting birds which I, I don't know what any of that means, but as it turns out, isn't that something? They just sing you to sleep. They're right there. They're just singing you to sleep. So we see these beautiful birds and we leave. It's like a 10 minute thing. Fast forward till I'm 28 and I'm driving along in my car and I decide I'm gonna find, I heard Uncle Philip moved not far from us and uh, I'm going to go ask him for some pigeons and see if he'll get me started in pigeons. And Keaton was five years old. Uh, by the time we had pigeons, he started first grade. 
uh, here in Mesa. And I went over to Phillips, and I, I remember as I turned the corner coming to his house, there was a flock of birds going over his house. And uh, I knew from that minute that I would like to have that happen at my house. And this happens at my house every morning. And this beautiful flock of birds, is that not beautiful? They, they just fly around my house like that, unless I'm in the yard, then what happens? They dive bomb me. I'm the only person they'll dive bomb because they don't know you but they will dive bomb me, they will zip past and see how close they can come to me. It's so much fun. They are beautiful. Look, they're beautiful over my house. And as I come around the corner to Monka Phillips' house, I see that going on. And I just, I, I thought, I gotta have that. And I go to Monka Phillip, and he's out in the pen. His wife says he's out in the pen. A, a kind of a ro rotund little Italian lady he married, because she's a great cook, he told me. And uh, she made pizzelles. Pizzelles, they're an Italian cookie that you, uh, they're like a little thin waffle and you uh, uh, powdered sugar coat them. Okay, well, anyway, uh, I heard there's pumpkin pie later. So here's the, here, here's the thing. I go out and he's sitting in his loft. He's sitting in the middle of his loft on a milk crate and he's talking to his birds. And he's about 75 years old. He's talking to his birds. And I go in and I say, he says, which one are you? Just like that. He knows I'm one of Conrad's boys. He doesn't know which one. I tell him, and I said, I want some birds. He says, you don't want birds, you won't take care of them. You know, very judgmental. And uh, I said, no, I would take care of them. He says, when you have a loft, I'll give you birds. A loft is what they call the pen. When you have a loft, I'll give you some birds to try. And I said, okay. So I went home. It happens the little rental house we were living in uh, had an abandoned shed in the backyard. Abandoned in that the whole front door, there was no front. It was one of those old corrugated aluminum things. There was no front. And so you weren't going to store anything in it, and it was sideways. But I stood it upright. All of a sudden, I feel energy in working in my yard. Isn't that funny how that works? And I stand up that thing, and I put some chicken wire on one end, and I turn some milk uh, crates upside down and hang them on the wall, and I get a couple of two-by-four studs and put in there because I saw some of those in Uncle Philip's bird house, and I, and, I, and I set this up, and I think, there, that's going to work. And I go back to Phillips about a week later, and he says, I didn't expect to see you again. And there I was. And I says, I want birds. And he says, have you got a place to keep them? And I said, yeah. And so he says, well, let's take a look, see what you want. And we go in, and I said, what's that bird? And he just got so tickled. I mean, this is like yesterday to me. He got so tickled. He says, why do you choose that bird? I said, that bird has a look. That bird looks like something. I said, he is powerful. And he says, how do you know he's a he? I said, look at him. He says, okay, you might like this sport because most people can't tell the difference in a boy and a girl pigeon. He says, that is a boy. And that is my number one bird of the 200 birds here. And you picked it. He says, and there's no way you'll ever own it. <laughs> and I said, okay. And, and I couldn't stop looking at it, but he gave me a black bird and a white bird to start because that's what I chose. After that one, this was a red bird. After that one, I said, well, a black one, a white. And then if they had babies, would they be like black and white? He said, yeah, that's how it works. So I got a black and white, and Keaton named them. A five-year-old kid there named them, and obviously, Pastor, he named one of them. Uh, he named one of them Snowball, religiously, and the other one he named Lucifer. And, uh, and Snowball uh, was a boy, and Lucifer was a girl, which I believe. And, uh, and together, they started, I took them back to my little crate there and put them in there, and it wasn't long before they went down on eggs. It took them about a week to 10 days. That's pretty typical for the pairing process. Uh, they'll start looking at each other. They won't like each other at first. They'll fight a lot. Uh, and they act very coy. They act like, I'm not interested in you. And he knows he's the only boy in there. But he, she's acting like, I'm not interested in you. And she's the only girl in there. And she's acting like, yeah, you can't have no matter what. You're not good enough for me. So they play this game. Now, I swear to you, if you saw what I see, you could name every bird after someone you know. Uh, in fact, you end up doing that. You'll have a bird that acts a certain way, and it'll remind you of a, guy, of a kid in high school, and you can't help it. That's goofball right there. That is that goofball that you went to school with. 
And you can't help it because they take on uh, these personalities that are just like people's personalities. So if you look at my 80, 90 birds I've got right now, I know every bird in there. Every one of them. I can tell you their parents. I can tell you their grandparents. I can tell you when their great-great-grandparents came to the United States from Europe. Now, I can't tell you that about my own great-great-grandparents uh, or what boat they were on, but I can tell you what boat these birds were on uh, because I have all of their records. And that's how that works is we keep records of our birds and we create birds together. We bring a bloodline of, of boy birds together with a bloodline of the girl bird and we put them together and we create a bird. I wonder what that's like. I mean, that's inbred in us, isn't it? The desire to be creators. I mean, that's who we are. Is Here we are on earth with dominion. And so we put certain birds together. Well, they had two babies and their baby's names were Domino and Oreo. Because one had black wings with a white body and one had white wings with a black body. And they were beautiful pairs. They were beautiful. I have a bird that looks similar to it. I actually have grand, great-grandkids of those same two birds. I'll show it to you uh, here in the third hour. So this is what that looked like. But they have a... This is what I was attracted to. Domino and Oreo, when they were 30 days old, I let them out of that pen. I cut a hole. Uncle Philip came over to help me because I couldn't do it. I mean, I was a mess. I mean, these are my babies, and I'm going to let them out and, like, lose them forever? And he says, you won't lose them. And he messes with you and says, you know, if you've been good to them, they'll stay. And what? You know, but he didn't, yeah, he was just messing with me. But I cut a little hole in the side of that that would fold down. The, the wall would just flap open like that, and it had two little chains on it. It was just so old-fashioned. Just plop down like that. And nothing else, no grates or anything to keep them from going out. But he, he showed me, just let, that, let them out. They'll go out and they'll fly around and they'll come back in. That first time I was sick to my stomach. What if they don't come back? He said, then they never really loved you. I know, I mean, that, that's not funny to me. He says, they will come back. Now, what's interesting is, to this day, I get sick to my stomach when I let them out the first time each year, the babies. I have to let the babies out. You have to let them fly because they're born to fly. The main thing about this presentation is what causes them to stay? What causes them to fly around my house? What causes them when that tree has two hawks that live in it that take one of their brothers and sisters from time to time on the wing from above attacks them what causes those birds to stay where i have raised them right there in that loft where i put them together what causes them to eat out of my mouth if i put seeds in my mouth what causes that stuff and what causes it is an instinct that these babies have to be home they have an instinct to be home that's where they want to be and home is where the first time they fly out, the first place they leave, the first place they walk out is home. So they may be born in one place and you might sneak them into somebody's loft so that they can fly them. But the first place as a 28 day old bird that they walk out on that little flop down thing and test their wings. And I mean, you are a doting mother the whole time. You're sitting there. And they'll just jump like six inches on the board and you'll go, <gasps> you know, like that with them. They'll go, they'll go and, oh, and you're just kind of watching like, you can, you can go, you can do it. You know, you're just kind of cheering them. And then they'll go 12 inches with two flaps. And it's like, oh my gosh, he, he almost had it. And then they'll go like five feet in the air and turn around and come back. And you think, oh, it's only a matter of time now. And then... They'll jump off the board, and you think, just like a, a jet going off the end of, a, of a, a cruiser, you'll think they're going into the water. They will find their air under their wings right there about a foot above the ground, and they'll flap, and you can just see it. Their heart pumps, and they go. And they are so fun to watch. 
The first time they'll do one loop and come back and land, and then they'll look around and see if anyone saw that. It's like, <laughs> they're unbelievable. They're looking around, and you tell right then for a minute, you'll know the boy birds from the girl bird. Because they'll get all puffed up, the boys will, and they'll start doing this around on the board, you know, like this. And the girls, they'll just know, they're just kind of like this. Oh, oh, oh. Just like that. And then they're champions of the air. Once they've tried it, they're champions of the air. And they'll go up and they dart and dive and try their wings and they'll disappear. And that's a scary one. That first time your whole flock leaves. You'll let them out in the morning like this and, and you'll look and they're going, they're Farmer Browns and then Farmer Jones and then wait, that's the Santan Mountain Range. They're gone. Sometimes they'll be gone an hour. And you'll go back out there and here they come. And they'll come back and they'll land. What caused them to come home? Well, they've tried everything to figure out what that is. Uh, it's magnetics. We know that. Uh, because a storm will mess them up. An electrical storm will mess them up. And uh, they'll get lost for a few hours and then they'll come home after the storm subsides or goes away. So we know there's some electricity in it. But there's also something in their DNA. And this is the part that relates them to the religious aspect of finding home, which I think is in all of us, a DNA, but we know we want to find home. Where is home? You know, we want to go back to our Creator. That's what happens there. They truly have a desire to find home. And I've got a little book for you I'm going to send home with you that explains that part of the story for you. I want to show you the other part of the story, though, tonight, and that is what, what do pigeons do? Why do they choose to come home? There's an interesting thing. I've had, I've had, only happened to me once, but I've read the magazine articles, where a bird will show up in the loft. And here's a bird, stray birds. Strays show up all the time. Not a stray commie. We call them commies if they're common birds. Commies. Because uh, they're, they're worthless. You know, truly they have little worth. Uh, and so uh, there's no commies in my loft. These are all purebred birds. But occasionally a commie will show up, but I'm talking about a bird will show up with a band on its foot, meaning it was raised somewhere by someone in an organized loft. There's a band on its leg. And you'll do some research on that, and they'll say, I don't know how, why this is here. This bird's from Kansas City. Here we're in Arizona. How'd that happen? Well, a tornado blew it off or something, you know, and it just showed up here. And research, they've done the research to find that a, a bird has shown up in my loft one time where its grandmother was born. Its grandmother was born there. I sold the grandmother to Kansas City and another generation later a baby was raised that came to my house as its home. Had to cross thousands of lofts, including a dozen in my neighborhood, to get to my loft where its grandmother was born. Help me with that. Nobody understands it other than to say their homing instinct isn't just instinct, it's an imprint of where they are. There's actually a, a DNA pattern that goes with the babies of what their parents have had in the past. That's really advanced, really advanced, and it's documented several times. So let's look at a few pictures. I'll show you some things that have happened since then. <coughs> This is a grandkid, this Henry, but this is part of the joy of having birds, is when you have birds, you have grandkids that love you. <laughs> you know, not every grandpa has a reason for the grandkids to like them. You know, some, believe this or not, some grandpas are grouchy. No, I've heard of it. Uh, they're grouchy and they're not super, you know, down on the floor, play with you kind of grandpas. But uh, here's a kid. And they're not afraid of them. You get them when they're two, three years old. Keaton's kid, you know, he climbed in the, it climbed through the door uh, where I let the birds out of. He was so little. We got pictures of him in there. But here's little old Henry, and he's with the birds. Look, he doesn't even know they're around him. He knows there's a picture being taken, so he's going to pose for you. Not a very good-looking kid, but you know, you get what you get right there. Uh, okay, now look at this. They're precious right i mean these are the prettiest creatures when they're born look at that i mean look look at this perfect little face i mean this is adorable right and by the way this little egg is one inch around 
It's one inch. They're just tiny. They're this big. Little pigeon eggs. You've seen them. And then there's that bird. So how big's the bird? He's, he's miniature. He's teeny tiny. And he fits in your hand. And they double in size every day. And by the time he's 28 days old, he's flying around your house. I mean, that is rapid growth. I mean, here this guy is. They're only in the egg uh, 17, 18 days. I mean, they, they're, a, they're a fast hatch. And it doesn't take them long uh, to become this, uh, this dinosaur-looking thing here. Uh, it doesn't take them long. Uh, and look, that's my wife's hand. I see the fingernails there. So she's not afraid of them. She loves the little babies. So when they're uh, seven, eight days old, you put a band on their leg. And this band is a little aluminum band that's got a number on it so that every bird has its own identity. There's a register of all the birds that are banded. They all have an identity. If you had a bird show up in your yard, you could go online and find the owner to that bird. And that bird might be from Timbuktu, like we said, because he could have been in a race and got blown off uh, way, and, and he ends up in your yard. I have it happen a couple times a year. We had someone call us from down in Cochise one time saying, we've got two birds in our, our yard, and they've got this band number on it. He said, how do you know that? Well, we have binoculars. We've been look, reading the bands on their leg. Well, we went down, they met us, and gave us the birds back. I mean, people are really into anything like that. Well, and then on my loft, I've got a satellite plate that's up underneath the landing board. The landing board's where they come land. There's a satellite plate up under there. And so when we let the birds out, they'll fly. When they come back, they walk across the satellite, and it tells me on my computer who it is. And it gives me the exact time of the day to the thousandth of a second. So what happens is we race these birds. You might be curious how that works. We'll take our best birds, we put them on a trailer, and we send them off somewhere. Everybody, everybody from the neighborhood sends them off somewhere, and at exactly 7 o'clock in the morning or 6 or 8, depending on when the sun comes up, they'll let them all go, and they'll record that time and the GPS to the inch where they're let go from. Every loft has a GPS inch also, and the computer calculates when my bird comes home, starts it at 7 o'clock, and when it walks across that pad, it calculates a race time so that we calculate the speed of the bird to the hundredth of a second. And the fastest bird wins the race. And races can be anything about for fun. I've got some trophies back there you can look at. I've got certificates of uh, the very first race I won uh, is... Uh, uh, right here and it's amazing to win your first race there's nothing like it it's right here Kevin Allen you get a diploma speaking of listen University <laughs> diploma and this says that uh, Kevin Allen won first in this young bird race from a distance of 247.134 miles and that in that race there were 282 birds from 35 lofts. So that's a big group. Out of all those birds, my bird was number one. And that bird was number 87 MRP, Mesa Racing Pigeon Club, 1648. Oh, that was a dandy bird. I remember that bird, a blue bar hen. Uh, she was a dandy, and she won my first race ever, 1987. What is that, 31 years ago? First race I ever won. I've been hooked on this for a long time, uh, and uh, it's a fun thing. Now, when you do a race, they calculate your race. Here's the race, and it says right there who's first. And let's just see how close the race was, uh, because I told you how they calculate it. These birds don't fly together all the time, but occasionally you'll get a close call. Well, here I am. I beat Novak by one one-hundredth of a second. And then the one after was four one hundredths. By the time you got to the tenth bird, it was three minutes and eighty, or three minutes and twenty-eight seconds. So it started getting space between it. But those first couple of birds probably came together and then split at the last minute to go to our lofts. So you do all kinds of things. You teach them to break. You know that they're coming from the east. If you're flying from the east, so we take those birds over to the goalposts because you know when they're coming true, they come right over that goalpost over there at uh, Queen Creek Junior High School. So you go every morning and you let them go from the goalpost, hoping that when the bird's 20 miles out, he'll see those goalposts and he'll line up on your house. So 
So, excuse me. So that he goes right through the goalpost, and Novak's birds are with him, and at the last minute, Novak's birds go, oh, wait a minute, this isn't the way to my house, and he shoots over there, and you win him. You believe that stuff's going on in the air. And we've watched it, we've filmed it, we've flown above them in our own private airplanes and watched what they do. You can train a bird to break. You can train a bird to do anything. And so those are the things that bird flyers do. Also, the way you feed them matters. On race day, you feed them different than you do regular days. You might give them barley on regular days, but you're giving them corn the day before race because you want that extra protein in there. So pretty exciting. I see a lot of you having a hard time holding your seats right there. Uh, but let's just see what else we got here. Okay, so here's a domino right here, see? Uh, this is out of that same bloodline. Uh, and then, uh, you know, how do you not love a little white bird uh, that'll sit on your shoulder and look in your ear while you take pictures? I mean, come on, that's amazing. Oh, look. They just want to kiss you because, you because you've fed them seeds out of your mouth because that's how their parents feed them. No, it's really pretty cool. Um, okay, so let me show you some more things. Huh? Okay. Trust me. It's a cool industry. You might not know that there are magazines about pigeon racing. This always surprises people. Dwight, you can't believe it. No. And, and here it is, and look what it's got in it. It's full of beautiful birds you can breed to if you have the money. This one right here, this red bird, would only cost you $25,000 to breed to. This is a poor man's sport. So only $25,000 to breed to that bird. There are cheaper birds in here, uh, but there are more expensive too. There's a couple of $100,000 baby birds in there. Um, but what you're looking at is the pedigree on a bird. You got the bird and then these lists are all the races they won. Now when you get a bird that wins that many races, it wasn't a lucky day. That bird's dominant and that's what you want in your law. All of my birds came from Belgium. These are Belgian birds. Belgium has the best birds. Ireland has some good birds. Uh, but that's where they come from. And there's all kinds of, of stories in here. Um, it, it, the first pigeon message in World War II. That's a great story. We used pigeons in World War II. They'd stick pigeons in their pockets or in their backpack. They'd go across the line, and then they'd find the uh, enemy gunneries, and they'd write it down on a piece of paper, put it on the bird's foot, and send it home. And then that person would call it in uh, and say, hey, you got gunners at this area, and they'd bomb them. I've got a story of a, of a bird called uh, G.I. Joe, that's actually in the Smithsonian Institute, stuffed, that saved 40 Canadians in a, in a raid because these guys got trapped behind enemy lines. They were trapped behind enemy lines and the bombs were coming. They were told, get out of there by 0400. The bombs are coming. And they were back there and the enemy surrounded them, not knowing it, but the enemy moved in behind them and they couldn't get out. And 0400's coming up, and they can't get out. They, they have documented that all 40 of those military men wrote their last will and testament and, and letters home. They knew they were going to die. They recorded it in their journals. They knew there was no way out, and they knew the bombs were coming. And at some point, someone said, I got one bird left. And he was a, a part of the Pigeon Corps. He says, I got one bird left. He said, this isn't a bird that I've used in the past because he isn't, he's only been to that location once or twice. It wasn't like where if they're born there, they return there, that actually train them to go to a different location. And he says, I, don't, I have no idea that he could make it. And they said, well, we're 40 miles away. He says, how's that going to work? And he says, I don't know, but we can try. And he wrote a note that says, Canadian this, blah, 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 we're stuck, don't bomb, don't do it, we're trapped. And he hooked that on G.I. Joe's leg and sent it flying. And the stories in the journals document that they saw the, the bombers come in, the B-17s. They saw them come in, they heard them first. They saw them come in, they saw the bomb bay doors open. These men were looking up at B-17s with the bomb bay doors open and just as they got overhead, 
The bomb bay doors closed and they went home. And the bird had made it. And they gave that bird the silver star and they stuffed that bird and put him in the, in the uh, institute. They waited till he died. But then they, <laughs> then they stuffed him and put him in the Smithsonian. And there's actually three birds in the Smithsonian. Uh, little Joe, uh, G.I. Joe, and there's another one. Amazing birds that have done great things. Okay, so uh, all of that's about birds. Let me show you a little bit about them. So I told you that we, we know about our birds. Now that magazine, this is a bird I bought. When you buy one, they want you to know you dealt with the right people. This is your bird. This is its pedigree. And, uh, and you bought from the right people. McLaughlin Lofts bought that in Boston. Uh, he had just brought that one in from Portugal. Uh, here's another one I bought uh, that I really like. This is another guy's way of showing the pedigree. But you can see, you know who that bird is. Look at this one. It's got a bird imprint in the background. I mean, this is another. These are just pedigrees of birds. Are we a little insane? Uh, what, huh? little bit uh-huh you're thinking that uh, and then look at this one I bought this is a red bird I bought and it actually has 30 pages of genealogy on that bird right here every race that ever flew every parent that ever won a race it's all right there it came with it that was part of the package that you got and this is my Kevin Allen Loft breeding book this is just my breeders and they're in here and all of their pedigrees are in here. Every bird with all his pedigrees. Uh, you can see that I, I color on things uh, to know what things are. Uh, and these are all the birds that I breed out of. And that's pretty fun to know every bird and know what they do. Now, I told you about race day. Race day is a big deal. Uh, when, they're, when they're about uh, six, seven months old, they enter their first races. Uh, in the young bird races, and everything they fly against is young, their age, this year. Born this year, we start those races here in September. So they could be nine months old, but some of them are five months old. They had to have been born since January 1st. You cannot put a band on a pigeon's leg until January 1st. So guess when the pigeon bands arrive at your house? January 1st. You don't get them a day before because nobody wants that edge to know, wait a minute, his bird's two days older than mine, no wonder he's stronger. And that's the way they do it, these guys are nuts. Pigeon flyers are nuts. Robin says she can tell when I've been at a pigeon meeting because I come home nuts and speaking a different language. Uh, hick, she calls it hick language, but they talk about their birds. You know what I'm talking about, kind of, you got that. So yeah, right here. So anyway, here's these young birds, you put them on a trailer, they go out somewhere, usually 150 on the first race. First time they're released, 150 miles away. It'll take them two and a half to three hours to come home. They'll fly 50 to 55 miles an hour. They never land. They come straight home because that's where their food and water is. They won't land anywhere else. They're coming home. They're finding home. They're crossing that line, and you're winning. Now, by the time you get to old birds, uh, that's anything over a year old. You're flying three, four, 500 miles. 500 miles is Salt Lake City. You let them up at Salt Lake City at 6 in the morning. They land here by 6 o'clock at night without ever landing. 55, 60 miles an hour. And they fly home to you. I mean, it's amazing. It's not a, it, it's, uh, Robin's been there when the birds come flying home in a snowstorm. When we lived in Utah, they'd fly home in a snowstorm. They'd hit that board and they'd just be drenched. But it's an amazing thing. So let me show you what it looks like. Can we do that? Are we ready? Uh, let's show you what it looks like when they let birds go. And maybe turn down that light right there, Jason, so that they can see this in here too, because this is one of my favorite things. This is a race in Spain. Let's see if we can see this. I think you're gonna enjoy this because most people never get to go behind the scenes and see what you're gonna see now. I think you're gonna see it. I'm very excited about this. <laughs> Is it happening? Huh? Tell what? A joke. Tell a joke? A pigeon joke. A pigeon joke. Okay, so a pigeon walked into a bar and uh, <laughs> no, there's, there's no such joke. Okay, here we go. This is a, this is a pigeon race, the top one 
It's a pigeon race, and uh, they're letting them go. We're not through yet. Keep watching. That's one truck. There's 200 trucks. That is a lot of birds. And I know what some of you are thinking. You don't want to be under that. Our birds don't do that. Just want you to know. How do they not? They just, they don't. We don't say poop from the audience. Here they are filling the skies. They're going to go up and circle together. And together they'll circle until the instinct kicks in and they know the direction home. And in this particular race, every direction is home. This is a race that they fly out of Spain, and there are birds from Ireland, there are birds from Portugal, there are birds from Italy in that race. There they are circling, and they're trying to find their bearings, and once they get their bearings, and it's amazing to watch. I've taken all of my kids and Robin, and you put them up, and they'll be like 300 in our groups. They'll go up and they'll circle, and they'll be in a tight, beautiful pack, and all of a sudden, three loops, four loops, and one bird will go and shoot out of there. And pretty soon, and then the rest of the birds will kind of go. But your superstar birds, they will find their way out of that group and they will head home. Let's lift those lights now. I'm going to show them my birds. Okay, so that's an amazing thing, and if any of you ever want to go let up birds with me, uh, I can do that with you any time. Uh, there's races going on right now, for instance, in the club. Uh, our club lets up about uh, 350 birds every Saturday morning from somewhere. Uh, this uh, next week, it's from Las Vegas. Uh, as far as winning a race, what do you get? I've, the most I've won in a race uh, is $14,000. Uh, that was the prize money, but there's a million-dollar race. Uh, this bird on the front... Uh, this bird won the million dollar race, won a million dollars in a race in South Africa. You send your babies there, they've never been out of the pen, you send them as babies on the airplane uh, and they go to South Africa and they train them to one loft, they're called one loft races, so that nobody has an advantage, just your breeding. And so that bird won the million dollar race, that bird lives uh, in Mesa. That bird lives in Mesa and uh, you can breed to it for 100,000. And uh, Robin believes that some of my birds in that guy's loft too, uh, because he has a way of, a, of accumulating other people's birds. Um, this is uh, that's an amazing bird, but million dollar race. There's five hundred thousand dollar. If he's watching today on YouTube, love you, bro. Uh, and uh, and and it's amazing how much money there is in it. We don't fly for money. It's against the law to fly for money in our state and in some states. Uh, it, paramutual betting isn't allowed in clubs because of the IRS rating of the club or something. So we don't fly for money. But when I lived in Texas, it's legal. And I'd be there at a bird race in Texas, and a guy would walk in, and he'd put up on the board. they track all of their betting on the board. And he'd put up there uh, 1648. That's his bird's number. That was that bird of mine that won. He'd put up 1648. He'd put over here $100,000. Those oil guys in Dallas are just nuts. I mean, they've got buku dinero. They've spent it on birds. They have the birds. And what he's saying is, I got 100 grand, says my bird beats your bird in this race. You think that's funny. Next thing you know, some other guy goes up there and puts his bird number beside it, meaning I take that bet. And by the time I left, the first time I went to the Dallas club, 11 guys put up 100 grand to fly it. And one guy won a million dollars. Because that race isn't the race between all the birds. It's just the race between those 10 birds within the race. I asked somebody about it, and he says they've been doing that for 10 years. Not one of them has ended at the end of the year with five cents. They just give each other their money back and forth, and it makes them feel good. But none of them have won two in a year, so they've all got their money back. And they think that's pretty funny. All right, so these are just a few birds I brought. I wanted to show you some colors. <coughs> This is my best bird. This is a red bird. These are all boy birds. And when you hold them, you hold them like this. You put their feet between your fingers like that. 
and then you hold their wings, and now that bird can't do anything. This bird cannot go anywhere. Uh, he's my best bird. Uh, he's, uh, he won uh, 11 races. I mean, that's amazing. He won 11 races, and he's made some of the best babies. Uh, not only has he won races, but his babies have won races. And that's what you go for. You want something that actually uh, generates and creates uh, goodness in the next level. You know, when we raced horses, it was the same thing. That there were a lot of them that could run, but that'd be the last one you'd ever see. So here's that bird, a red check it's called. Here's its number right here. It gives you its year, its band number. Uh, where it was uh, bred, you can find out everything about it right there with that band. And uh, this is just a great bird. He's mean to other birds, but he's just a, he's just a beautiful bird, isn't he? Look at that. He's just beautiful. What's his name? Big Red. Oh. I call him Big Red, uh, but his, uh, his name is Viper. His registered name is Viper. Yeah. That kid can come up here and hold him if he'd like. Uh, so here's that wing. And uh, come on up. I'm going to show you how to hold them. Now, when someone gives a bird to you, they give them to you to the face like this, and you see the only thing that you care about is those wings. If they flap, that bird's gone. So when you take the bird, you take your thumbs and control the wings, and you just put your hands down here on the breast, and then he can't touch you. Okay? He wouldn't hurt you, but cover that wing with that thumb and that wing with that thumb and squeeze it on the breast. Now that bird can't get away. You see how you totally control it? Nice. And I know you want to feel it up against you. Uh, it's a natural thing uh, to want to hold those birds close. Thank you very much. But you can see. This bird is covered in powder. It's covered in powder uh, because, because if it rains, if it rains, this bird doesn't get wet. And if it gets in the water, that's just how it goes. No. That's natural powder right there. Now, uh, that bird's asleep now. It, he's dark. He didn't. He's got a mask on his head. He just. I. You can hear him snore. No, he's not asleep. But he can't go anywhere. Obviously, his wings are trapped. Uh, he, this is uh, actually Snowball's great grandson. From that very first bird I had, you can see that he is mostly all white. By the way, that's called vibration, and it's actually something you look for in a good bird. It means that they're really intense, and they're jacked up and excited. That's vibration. That bird wants to fly. That's a, a sign of a good bird, vibration. And here it is. He's got those wings, just big and white. He's got eagle wings. He's got a little bit of red on his neck. Um, here, see the powder come off of him when I pet him? Huh? No, it's just, it's perfect. It's a little, it's a little talcum powder. It's just really, really, really soft. Huh? Yeah, it's natural. It's natural. So that's a white and a red. I wanted to show you those two different colors. And uh, this is Lucifer's great-grandson. You can see she's black. And look what happened to her. That's pretty intense, huh? Just got a little bit of white in her. A little bit of that right there. And by the way, she's missing a feather right there. You can see that one's missing. And, and that's shorter because that's a new one coming out. She'll grow that quill right there. And it'll be the longest one. And this one's just coming out too. See a brand new little feather there. That'll be the longest, biggest feather. They molt every year. They lose every feather every year and so you get that in your loft a lot a lot of cleanup that way of feathers so that's lucifer and he's beautiful but here's the two most common colors uh, this one you think you've seen at the park but you haven't uh, this is what most pigeons look like right here and those are called blue bars this is a blue bird and that's a blue bar the color of this bird is blue bar and uh, he's registered as a blue bar because he's got those blue bars going across his wings. Just like that. And so, so pure and refined in the gray, but those blue bars go across. And most real devout pigeon flyers will only fly two colors, blue bars 
and blue checks. This is a blue check. Oh, wow. You can see its bars got all checkered on him. That's the only difference. They're the same color. Uh, those are both Holland birds, actually, but uh, blue checks. And those are the only two colors some wasps will fly because they say everything else is a pretend bird, but that's a real one. That's a race bird. Blue check, blue bar. Hmm? No, because these are prisoners. These I bought from Holland or somewhere. Remember, if they're not born where you are, then they can't go fly. These birds fly in their loft, but they don't circle the house. These are breeders, and so they don't do that. I, okay, what? You're going to beat me up because I don't let these birds out? Their loft is as big as this place. They're, they're fine. They can fly. All right, so I just want to thank you very much for letting me talk about uh, my, my passion, which is pigeon flying. I love pigeon flying. There's just something about putting two parents together to see if you can make a top flyer. I mean, you, you want to compete. And there's something about t putting two birds together and getting a baby and seeing that baby come out of the shell and wondering what color is it going to be. And then those first little feathers start to pop and, and you see what color it's going to be. And is it a boy or a girl? And pretty soon you know that. And just one thing after another, you watch this baby uh, grow up and you, then you see it playing with its friends and pretty quick you're pretty sure you know if this thing's going to be a flyer or not because of the way he acts with his friends you know yeah he's not aggressive enough he's not going to be a flyer or, or he's too aggressive and he'll burn out in the first 10 miles and and he'll be worthless you start making these judgments about your kids i mean your pigeons and before long before long they surprise you and you can almost never know. Other than the parentage, you can't really tell what a pigeon's going to become. And once they become what they are, and they continue to fly to you, and they continue to eat out of your hand, and they continue to trust you with their life, there's something about it. And it's just something I've loved to do, and I, uh, I have a book for each of you called Finding Home uh, that I think you'll enjoy. It talks about the homing spirit, and uh, that we have it too, and that we have a place we need to uh, find a way back to and the pigeons do every time so afterwards if you have any questions you want to look at some trophies and awards or pictures of birds or whatever you want to do uh, if you want to hold a bird I'm happy to put one of those in your hand show you how to hold it and uh, thank you very much for being here and thank you listening University for having me thank you yeah.